Hello, everyone, and welcome to the HHQI December 2016 Cardiovascular Learning Action Network, or the CardioLAN. We'd like to thank all of you for taking the time today to join us. We hope that you will find this information not only interesting, but also applicable to your care setting. And for those of you that are listening to us in the recording, we appreciate you taking the time as well. We're very very excited today to talk about cholesterol, and we have a wonderful guest speaker that I'll introduce you to a little more formally in a little bit. But first, we'd like to go ahead and mention to everyone that this session today is approved for 1.25 nursing hours of continuing education. You can read the information on the screen. Additional information on how to obtain this, these 1.25 hours will be discussed a little later in the session. For those of you that I haven't met, my name is Cindy Sun, and along with from the HHQI team, we also have Misty Kevich today, and she and I are both RN project coordinators for HHQI, so we're thrilled to be here. I'm going to keep the announcements very short today just to let everybody know where we stand on things. Starting with HHQI, there are currently almost at 17,000 participants. We are within just a few of that, so that's going to be a very exciting landmark for us. We're happy to get to that point. And that's representing about 5,600 home health agencies. So we want to thank all of you for participating and continuing to support and continue to try to improve the quality of care that the home health patients are receiving. A few other announcements I wanted to make. It's our third Thursday, as you know. This is our third Thursday event. And every third Thursday of the month, there is something going on at HHQI. So this month is Cardio Land. January 3rd Thursday, so you can mark your calendars, will be January 19th. And at that time, I wanted to just read this to you so I don't mess it up. Home and Community-Based Services, HCBS, and how partnering with a quality-focused organization can improve patient outcomes. We're going to have representatives coming in and telling us about this and how best to partner so that we can continue to improve the quality that the patients receive. Now, February, an event I wanted to mention to you because this is pretty fresh and all. We haven't made any real public announcements about this, but the very excited Dr. Janet Wright, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Million Hearts, the Million Hearts Initiative, which is the CMS, CMS, CMS CDC initiative focusing on reduction of one million heart attacks and strokes, is coming on to our event to explain Million Hearts 2.0 and where community-based cardiovascular prevention is going. Community-based, that's home health. So we're just beside ourselves that she has accepted for the, especially for that specific day. So with that, I think I'll end the announcements and I would like to just take a moment and introduce you to Chelsea Leonard. If you read the My HHQI blog, you've read Chelsea's blog in September of this year with the same title as today's webinar, which was Cholesterol, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. After reading her blog and talking to her a little bit more, we decided that she just has a wealth of information to share, and she was gracious enough to join us today to elaborate more, not only on the cholesterol, but also how best to use a pharmacist in the community to help our home health patients. So Chelsea graduated from East Tennessee State University, Bill Gatton College of Pharmacy in May of 2015 and completed a postgraduate community pharmacy residency with Stanford University in the Quarter School of Pharmacy at Chad's Payless Pharmacy. After the completion of her residency, she stayed at Chad Payless Pharmacy as the Clinical Service Coordinator and has experience in chronic disease management, including hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and diabetes. And with that, I would like to say welcome, Chelsea, and I will pass the ball to you right now. Thank you very much. Chelsea, were you able to get the ball? I was, but I kept getting muted for some reason. I'm sorry about that. Um, but but that's not a problem. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for the introduction, Cindy, and thank you all again for inviting me to be your guest speaker today. I'm really excited about it, and I hope that 
I give you all some good information. So just to, up front, I do not have anything to disclose. And listed here are the objectives that we're going to go through today during the presentation, and I hope that we will meet these by the end of my slides. According to the most recent data from the CDC, 73.5 million adults, which is about 37% of adults in the United States, have high LDL. And we'll talk about LDL a little bit more in a few minutes. So having high cholesterol increases one's risk by twofold to develop heart disease, which is the leading cause of death for adults in the United States. Other risk factors for heart disease include diabetes, obesity, poor diet, physical inactivity, and excessive alcohol intake, some of which commonly go hand in hand with high cholesterol. Less than half of adults with high cholesterol actually receive treatment for it. So this is really important because of the fact that, high, that heart disease is so prevalent in America. And as healthcare providers who commonly have contact with patients, this is something that we can affect if we know that patients have high cholesterol and aren't being treated for it. As I mentioned previously, heart disease is the number one cause of death for adults in America. And the map on this slide shows the prevalence of the disease with the darker colors indicating higher death rates. And so that's why it's important to manage and treat high cholesterol. What exactly is cholesterol, though? It's a waxy, fat-like substance that travels through the blood attached to proteins called lipoproteins. It's produced by the liver to help make hormones and vitamin D, and it helps digest fatty foods, which may seem kind of ironic, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Cholesterol is also found in foods like eggs, cheese, and fatty meat. When your, blood, when your body has too much cholesterol, it can build up on the walls of your blood vessels, and these deposits are called plaques. As your blood vessels build up plaque deposits over time, the inside of the vessels narrow and allow less blood flow through to your heart and other, or other organs. When a plaque buildup totally blocks an artery carrying blood to the heart, it can cause a heart attack. And then another cause of a heart attack is when a plaque deposit bursts and releases a clot in the artery. Angina is caused by plaque partially blocking a coronary artery, which reduces blood flow to the heart and causes chest pain. And so in this picture here, you can kind of see where the plaque has built up, and it's limiting the blood, blood, blood flow through the artery. So when a patient has their blood work done, the cholesterol panel will come back with a few different numbers. And the most common numbers include HDL. So this is a good cholesterol. HDL absorbs the bad cholesterol and takes it back to the liver to be flushed out of the body. So that's how high cholesterol can help digest fatty foods. Having higher levels of HDL can reduce the risk of heart disease and stroke and the ideal level for HDL is around 40 or higher. Typically between 40 and 60 is what we aim for. The next one is LDL, and this is the bad cholesterol. This is the one that makes up the majority of the body's cholesterol, and this number is often the one that's the target of most medications. High levels of this is what causes the plaque buildup that can lead to heart disease and stroke. And the ideal level of LDL is less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. And again, we'll talk about some ways to improve these numbers later on. The next type of cholesterol is called or the triglycerides. And we call these the ugly cholesterol just for the sake of the catchy title, but um, that's not typically what they're referred to as. But they are a type of fat found in the blood. And they do, if you were looking at, at real blood, these would look like blobs of grease just floating through there. Triglycerides are really affected by eating fatty foods, refined sugars, and carbohydrates. And the ideal level of triglycerides is less than 150. However, if they, the triglycerides are really high, typically around or over 500, 
this is when they would become the main target to treat with medications. So I want to show you all what a triglyceride looks like here on the next slide. They're made up of a glycerol backbone with three fatty acid chains attached. And so glycerol can be a building block for glucose or sugar. So essentially a triglyceride is a sugar with fat attached to it. So this is why high triglycerides are common in patients with diabetes. And so if we decrease the amount of sugar a patient eats, we can help decrease the triglycerides because the fat doesn't have anything to attach to. And then um, all of these numbers are combined to be the total cholesterol, and the ideal level is less than 200 milligrams per deciliter. The CDC recommends that all adults over 20 years old have a fasting lipid panel performed at least every five years, although there are some providers who choose to do this annually or more frequently if they're having a hard time getting their cholesterol under control. It's also very important to ensure that a patient has been fasting for at least eight hours with no food or drink except for water or black coffee. If not, the results will be inaccurate, and the sample might end up looking something like what's in this photo here. So that looks pretty gross, um, and that would probably be what it would look like if I went for a lab draw right after I had a giant breakfast platter from Cracker Barrel. So don't want to do that. You want to make sure that patients aren't, that they have been fasting, um, because if the results come back inaccurate, it could potentially lead to unnecessary medication or treatment. And we don't want patients to be on medications unless they absolutely have to be. So this leads me to my next topic. Now we know what the lipid panel and what those numbers mean. So what do we do with that? And that'll be our first polling question. So what is the ideal level of total cholesterol? And so we'll give you all a little bit to respond. And um, I'll keep going while, while you all respond to this question. The guidelines that I'll be talking to you all today about are from the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association. And these are, these are the guidelines that they posted and published in 2013. These guidelines shifted the focus of treatment from just treating the numbers to treating the, the risk that the patient had of an adverse cardiovascular event. So you'll hear me mention the term ASCVD, or atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and ASCVD outcomes. ASCVD itself includes acute coronary syndrome, myocardial infarction, angina, stroke, transient ischemic attacks, and peripheral arterial disease. And their goal is to prevent um, ASCVD outcomes, and the outcomes they typically look at are myocardial infarction, stroke, and even death. So again, these guidelines are aiming to prevent these outcomes from happening. So before we get further into the, um, the treatment guidelines, we want to so the response to the poll question, and the majority of you all got it right. It is the ideal level of total cholesterol is less than 200. So back to the guidelines, they suggest four groups who will benefit from statin medication therapy. And I'm sure most of you have heard of statin medications, and we are definitely going to talk about those. But the four groups that they recommend for treatment with a statin medication are patients with clinical ASCVD, so patients who have been diagnosed with one of the diseases that I mentioned on the previous slide, patients who have an LDL greater than 90, or I mean more than 90, and then the next group are patients who are 40 to 75 years old who have diabetes and an LDL of 70 to 189. And then the last statin benefit group are patients who do not have a diagnosis of clinical ASCVD, they don't have diabetes, 
but they do have a 10-year risk score of 7.5% or higher. So I've been talking about this risk. And this next slide will show how it has been, um, how the risk is calculated. The 10-year risk estimate is the probability of a patient having one of those ASCVD events within the next 10 years, so a stroke, heart attack, or death. And a number of factors go into this calculation of the 10-year risk, including gender, age, race, certain numbers from the cholesterol panel, whether or not they smoke, and if they have diabetes or high blood pressure. I've also included the link here on this slide, so if y'all want to test it out on yourselves, you can do that. The statin medications are listed here on this slide. You'll, the more common ones you'll see are atorvastatin, which is Lipitor, rosuvastatin, which is Crestor, and simvastatin, which is Zocor. Um, there's also lovastatin and pravastatin, which I accidentally left off of this slide. And then the less common statins are patavastatin, which is Lavalo, and fluvastatin, which is less call. And I, probably the reason that these are less common is because they're more expensive than the other statin medications. Statins work to inhibit an enzyme in the liver called HMG-CoA reductase. And this enzyme is used in the production of cholesterol. So by inhibiting this enzyme, this decreases the amount of cholesterol floating around in the blood. Statins are the most potent total cholesterol and LDL lowering agents. They also help increase HDL and decrease triglycerides as well. The reason that statins are first line medications for cholesterol treatment is that they have shown a proven decrease in morbidity and mortality. So they, um, so these medicines help you live longer. They also exhibit some effects that don't have anything to do with lowering cholesterol. They can help increase the stability of those plaques in the arteries, so they keep them from breaking off and traveling to other areas in the body. They can help decrease inflammation, and inflammation can lead to coronary artery disease. And they can inhibit the thrombogenic response. So this is what causes blood clots. And statins do have some effect on the, the clotting cascade that happens when the blood is trying to clot. But the way that these effects occur in the body is not quite understood yet. However, there is research being done to determine the full extent of these effects. This slide here shows the algorithm for choosing a statin for a patient. And depending on their risk factors and their age, they will either receive a low, moderate, or high intensity statin. And these aren't hard limits, though, because there are other factors that can play into the decision. This slide here just shows each statin broken up by intensity. Low-intensity statins can help lower LDL by about 30%. Moderate-intensity statins can help lower LDL by 30 to 50%. And high-intensity statins can help lower LDL by more than 50%. And I would like to point out here that the only two high-intensity statins are atorvastatin, the Lipitor, and rosuvastatin, which is Crestor. Statins are typically given in the evening or at bedtime because this is when the majority of the cholesterol is produced. Atorvastatin, rosuvastatin, and potatostatin can be given at any time of the day because they last longer in the body than other medications. The most common side effect reported, and I'm sure you've all heard about this, are muscle symptoms. So you will hear many patients complain about muscle cramps, pain, and weakness, and the risk of this occurring is more common in women. If symptoms become an issue, the dose of the statin could be lowered or they could be potentially switched to a different statin altogether. However, this should always be discussed with the prescriber before a medication is changed. And I forgot to put this on the slide, but statins should not be used if the patient is pregnant or breastfeeding. 
There are also some important drug interactions with statins that I would encourage you to watch for when you're reviewing patient's medication list. Um, the patient's pharmacist should also be checking for interactions and should alert a prescriber if a serious interaction is detected. But it's also, it's good to know what, what interacts with these medications. And one that you can really help with is the interaction with grapefruit and grapefruit juice. So grapefruit juice inhibits the metabolism of statins, so it sticks around in the body longer and it increases the risk of side effects, particularly the muscle symptoms. So I know we have a ton of patients, which I don't like grapefruit juice, but we have people who love it. And so they're always concerned about whether or not they can drink grapefruit juice with their medications because they've heard that they can't with their statin, so they think it's for, for all medicines. But it's always good to check and see if there are any interactions with medication. And next we'll talk about some of the non-statin medications used to treat cholesterol. And although these are not recommended first line, these are other medications that can help lower total cholesterol. The first category we'll talk about are the bile acid sequesters. So this includes, I'll go back to the slide to show you, um, the cholestyramine, cholestipol, and cholecevaline. The sequestrants bind to bile acids in the intestine and prevent them from being reabsorbed in the blood. So then the liver produces more bile to replace the bile that has been lost. And because the body needs cholesterol to make bile, the liver uses up the cholesterol in the blood, which reduces the amount of LDL circulating in the blood. So that's how the bile acid sequestrants work to lower cholesterol. They can help lower LDL by about 15 to 30 percent, and they're also useful when a patient has diabetes because they also help lower blood sugar. The most common side effect from this medication class are the gastrointestinal effects. They commonly cause constipation, bloating, and belching, and we have people complain about it all the time. So to help with these side effects, the dose should be titrated up slowly and gradually increase, and they should take it with lots of water and help increase their fiber intake to prevent the constipation. Um, these medications can also bind with other medications or even prevent them from being absorbed so they should be separated from any other medications that the patient is taking. They should be given either one hour before or four hours after other medications. The next class of medications are the fibric acid derivatives. So this is phenofibrate and gemfibrazil, or Lopid, and phenofibrate is Tricor. So these medications can help um, increase HDL and decrease triglycerides. And the way that they do this is they activate a receptor that helps increase the breakdown and elimination of triglycerides. With these medications, there have some GI side effects as well. We see more nausea and vomiting here with these than we do constipation with the bile acid sequestrant. With the fibric acid derivatives, if they are combined with statins, this can also increase the risk of muscle symptoms, so the patient should be monitored for these effects. However, if you, if you happen to see a patient on genfibrazil and simvastatin or lovastatin, so, um, this, should be, this is a combination that should be avoided because it can greatly increase the risk of the muscle symptoms. And then another administration point of note Gen Fibrazil should be given 30 minutes before meals, and that would also help alleviate some of the side effects. The next class is the cholesterol absorption inhibitor, and the only one in this class so far is Zetia. And this can decrease LDL by about 17%. And this class of medications does exactly what it says it does. It inhibits the absorption of cholesterol in the small intestine. These medications are typically tolerated very well with very few side effects, but it can increase liver enzymes. So these should be checked when patients have their normal blood work done and they're probably already being monitored anyway. The 
The next medication that's used um, in addition to statins is niacin. And to be honest, they're not really sure how niacin works to help with cholesterol, but it is able to decrease LDL, increase HDL, and decrease triglycerides. And the most common side effect with niacin is flushing and itching. And I'll tell you all a story. When I was in pharmacy school, they had us take, take a big dose of niacin um, just to experience what it what the flushing felt like, and it was not fun. So anytime I have a patient on it, I'll be sure, I'm always sure to ask them um, what they do to help, to help with flushing or if they, if they even know about it. So it's important to educate them on this side effect because they might stop taking it if they don't like the way it feels. And there are things that can be done to alleviate this side effect. So the first, the first thing is, um, to get 325 milligrams of aspirin about 30 minutes before niacin. And you want to be sure to make sure that they are not already taking an aspirin or, um, or another blood thinner. So again, be sure to consult with their prescriber before adding anything. Um, it's also helpful to tell them to avoid spicy foods and hot beverages. And then there is also an extended release formulation that's prescription only, and this can reduce the flushing side effects as well. And just like the fibric acid derivatives, the combination with statins can increase the muscle symptoms, so be sure to monitor this with patients. And that's just as simple as asking them if they're having any, any muscle pain. Um, again, it can be given with, given with food to help reduce the side effects. And the no flush formulation, which I'm sure you all have seen advertised, I have patients ask me about it almost weekly. Um, they should be avoided because they're missing a key ingredient in them that does not actually affect the lipid panel. So avoid the no flush formulation. So that will lead us to our next poll question, which is which class of medications does not decrease LDL? Is it the fibric acid derivatives, statins, vial acid sequestrants, or cholesterol absorption inhibitors? And so I'll let y'all answer that question, and we'll keep going. So in addition to medications, it's very important that we encourage patients to implement lifestyle changes to help improve their cholesterol and their overall health. I think I skipped a slide. Okay, yeah. Lifestyle changes are recommended as background therapy for all patients. And these changes are typically started for three to six months before medications are started because there are some patients who can control their cholesterol with lifestyle changes alone. However, lifestyle changes should not be stopped just because a patient starts medication. I had a patient tell me that they're taking a statin. They can eat whatever they want, but their cholesterol is going to be just fine because of their medication. But that's not really how it works. You can help patients with their lifestyle modifications by encouraging a heart-healthy diet, so low fat and high fiber. And then the American Heart Association recommends the DASH diet, which calls for low sodium and low saturated fat. Many patients don't know how to read nutrition labels, so this is a huge area for you to be able to help with. You can show them what they need to be looking for when they're at the grocery store and help them make better choices with their food. <coughs> Excuse me. Regular exercise is also important, and the recommendation from the American Heart Association now is 40 minutes three to four times per week. And then avoiding tobacco products and maintaining a healthy weight are also important in managing high cholesterol. So in addition to the prescription medications and lifestyle modifications, there are also some over-the-counter supplements that can aid in improving cholesterol. But again, just a disclaimer, a prescriber or a pharmacist should be consulted before adding any over-the-counter supplements. And so I'll go back to our polling question, polling question, which class of medications does not decrease LDL? 
And the correct answer was the fabric acid derivative, and so the majority of y'all got that right. All right, the first over-the-counter supplement that I'll talk about is CoQ10. And this one has, um, the, the coenzyme Q10 is depleted when you're on, when a patient is taking a statin. And so by adding that back in, this has shown some benefit in reducing the muscle system from statin. This supplement is, is pretty inexpensive and relatively low risk, but it should not be taken if a patient is on a blood thinner like Warfarin. The next supplement is the omega-3 fish oil. This can help decrease triglycerides and increase HDL, so it'll help increase the good cholesterol as well. And the most common complaint with the omega-3s is a fishy aftertaste. And there's, there is an enteric-coated version that can prevent this, but the enteric-coated version is a little bit more expensive. So if cost is a factor for your patient, he could tell them to freeze the capsules and take them with food to help avoid a yucky aftertaste. These should also not be taken if the patient is on a blood thinner like warfarin. And then there are other, if they don't want to take the fish oil capsules and they just want to get it through the foods that they eat, um, omega-3s can also be found in flax seeds, chia seeds, walnuts, and then just eating seafood. The next supplement is red yeast rice, and it is considered the natural statin. And y'all can't see me doing this, but I just did my air quotes over natural statin. But it's called that because it contains the substance called monocolon K, which is chemically, identi I ooh, chemically identical to the active ingredient in lovastatin. And since it's the, pretty much the same ingredient, the side effects and the drug interactions are very similar, so be sure to watch for that. But it also may be useful if a patient has tried a statin and they weren't able to tolerate it or they, they did have some of the muscle symptoms, this could be a potential option for them if you're still having trouble helping them get their LDL lowered. And just like the regular statin, this medication should not be used if the patient is pregnant or breastfeeding. And the last one we'll talk about today, um, wouldn't necessarily consider this an over-the-counter supplement, but it is something that is not medication that they could use. It's red wine. And red wine has a key ingredient in it called resveratrol that helps lower, and I, I made a typo on this slide, helps decrease LDL and protects against plaque buildup in the arteries. And um, I know it's a controversial topic, but if, if you do have a patient that likes, that likes wine and they also have cholesterol problems, this could be a potential option for them. So the recommendation for red wine is um, five ounces of wine is considered one drink. And so for women and men greater than 65, the recommendation is one drink per day. And for men younger than 65, they could do up to two drinks per day. And it's very important to emphasize that it's five ounces of wine because some people have different definitions for what the size of a drink is. This ingredient, the resveratrol, is also found in red and purple grapes, blueberries and cranberries, um, but there's not really good evidence behind them and the, just getting the resveratrol from these ingredients may not be as, um, as beneficial. So if you ever have questions or concerns about medications or over-the-counter supplements, please contact your local pharmacist. Um, I can almost guarantee that they'll be happy to help you, but if they're not, give me a call. My contact information will be at the end of this, at the end of the presentation. So that brings us to our next polling question. Do you have a community pharmacist you communicate with regularly? And I'll let y'all answer that question and we will keep on going. So the first thing that your pharmacist can really help you with is helping your patients be adherent. 
And I think, I'm sure we all know that medications are not going to be effective unless they're taken properly and taken exactly as prescribed. And most of the adherence issues that I've seen have been because of cost. And so your pharmacist can help you identify cheaper alternatives and make recommendations to the prescriber if cost is an issue. Another adherence issue that I see a lot is that patients are on lots and lots of medications. And so your pharmacist might be able to help you look at their med list and see if there's anything that they maybe don't need and help to try to streamline their therapy to decrease the number of medications that they take. The next adherence issue is forgetfulness. And I know this one very well. I forget to take my multivitamin every, almost every day. So I can imagine how difficult it is to keep up with several medications. So I usually tell patients to keep their medications where they'll see them every day. So um, usually by like the kitchen sink or a cabinet near the refrigerator, somewhere where they'll, they'll be every day. Um, just not in the bathroom because heat and moisture is not a good idea. It's not a good combination for medications. Or if a patient's tech savvy, I'll encourage them to set an alarm on their phone. Um, some pharmacies might even package medications to help make them easier to deal with for patients. My pharmacy, we do weekly packs that we'll give to the patient. We'll give them four packs per month, and they're divided up into morning, noon, evening, and bedtime. And we have so many patients that use these, and they're really helpful to help them keep track of when they've taken their medication. The next one we'll talk about is side effects. This is another common reason for adherence problems. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that some of the side effects can be reduced by taking a medication with food or at a different time of the day. And um, that's something that we can help you all with. If you, if you notice that a patient is having a side effect, we can try to take a look at it and see if there is anything that can be done to alleviate it. And if not, we can check to see if the dose is too high, and we can communicate with the prescriber to make other recommendations. And again, like I said, with the statins, if they're having muscle cramps, CoQ10 might be an option. So your pharmacist can also recommend over-the-counter agents that might help with side effects. We can also identify drug interactions and communicate these with the prescriber if an action needs to be taken, and um, we can also help determine if the interactions can be prevented if the medications are separated. So like the bile acid sequestrants where they need to be given either an hour before or four hours after another medication. This is a great way to use your pharmacist because they will be able to let you know if, they're, if they see any interactions that are concerning. At our pharmacy, we also provide point of care testing, and many pharmacies around around the country have the capability to check their check cholesterol in the pharmacy. So if you have a patient who has trouble getting to the doctor or they live far away from their doctor, but they're close to a pharmacy, check with that pharmacy to see if they have the ability to check cholesterol in the store because we can provide results in about five minutes and then we can make recommendations from there. This also helps save the patient a copay at their doctor's office um, if, that, if the cost is something that is limiting to the patient. So I encourage you to find a pharmacist that you trust and communicate with them regularly because they can be great resources for you and your patient. And then I've just gotten the poll results back and it's split about half and half for those of you who do have a community pharmacist that you can communicate with regularly. So there are some new updates for cholesterol guidelines that you all might have heard about. The United States Preventive Services Task Force released very new recommendations in November. And they recommended that all patients 40 and older who have at least one of these risk factors risk factors listed should be screened to see if they need a statin 
regardless of their cardiovascular disease history. So there's not a lot of information out on this yet. So I just wanted to let you all know about this because it might be coming down the pipeline. There might be more people on statins than we could have imagined. They're not, they might be putting us all on one. So we are going to be taking questions, I guess, in a little bit. Um, but feel free to reach out, reach out um, to me if you have any additional questions that might arise. I've got my contact information listed here. And then all of my references that I use for this presentation are right here. And now I will turn the ball over to Misty, if I can get back to that. While you're doing that, this is Cindy. I'll just, uh, if you don't mind, Chelsea, we'll just stop for a minute for a few questions that have come in. And yeah. um, uh, one of the first questions that came in was about asking uh, about patients' concerns with Lipitor or one of the statins causing diabetes. Okay. Yes, and I've heard that several times as well. And I think the, the problem there is, you know, I mentioned when patients start taking medication, they, they stop caring about the foods that they eat and they don't, they think that just because they're taking that medication, they don't have to worry about what they're putting in their body. And so then they're doing that and they're eating poorly and they aren't exercising and so they end up developing diabetes. And so it, it seems like it might be a side effect of the medication, but really it's just because, because patients aren't aren't taking care of, of, of themselves and they're not eating properly. So that that's all I've seen on that. There's not really any um, data supporting that the medication actually causes diabetes. Well, thanks for that because I, I think all of us, especially in the home, we're dealing with patients that sometimes don't have the best information coming at them and they're catching their news, as we all do, on different news sources that may not actually be news. So it's a good place for us in home health to be able to help the patients under, understand not only this information, but how to discern what is accurate medical information and what is something to maybe discuss a little further. Uh, wow. Quite a few more. Let me just go ahead through a couple of these, if you don't mind. Okay. If total cholesterol is greater than 200, so sorry, it just jumped on my screen here. I want to get this question, up, but I want to read it correctly. <laughs> if total cholesterol is greater than 200, but HDL is very high and the LDL is very low, is there a concern? Um, you know, I I have never heard any any practitioner be upset about a, a high HDL. Mm -hmm. But then again, there's still the total cholesterol number. Um, being that high, there might be some concern. So that might be a call for maybe another another cholesterol panel. Maybe there was something wonky that happened with that first one. And then that too, might, their triglycerides might be high with that total cholesterol number being as high with the, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Um, so just wanna check on all of those things. But typically if the HDL is higher, I'm, I'm not going to be as concerned. Yeah, and I, I agree with you. I read something recently that was similar to that, and uh, it seemed to be the conclusion of the article was basically a case-by-case -case basis, exactly what I think you're saying there. So that was a really great question, the person who sent that in. Thank that you. Was, that was a good question. <laughs> uh, one more, and then we're going to move on, and we'll come back to questions at the end. So for those of you that continue to have questions, continue sending them in in the Q&A section. And we'll come back to questions with Chelsea in just a moment. Uh, this next one is, I heard that there is a contradictory recommendation related to fish oil supplements. Which supplement would you recommend related to absorption? Um, that's a great question. And I, I don't know. The, the, rec the one that we have most of our patients on is just the 1,000 milligram omega-3 fish oil. And they, we do have... All, all of the patients who get it um, from our pharmacy get the enteric coated version to prevent the, the side effects. But as far as absorption goes, I'm not really I'm not really sure about that. So if you want to send um, send your contact information, I can get back to you on that one. 
And I know that I said that would be the last question, but this one kind of relates to that. Could you repeat why the statin shouldn't be taken with omega-3s? Yes, um, because they can, or the statins can be taken with omega-3. Let me, oh, let me okay. pull, back up, pull up that slide again to make sure. Yeah, I thought you mentioned that the omega-3s would help with the uh, leg cramps. I was taking a lot of notes here. I'm sure everybody was doing the same thing. I was scribbling as fast <laughs> as I could. I can tell I'm personally going to be re-listening to this webinar. <laughs> <laughs> and I apologize. I did probably talk too fast. No, um, you did great. It wasn't you. It was that you had such great information. <laughs> and um, for me personally, you laid it out really logically that I hadn't seen it before. And um, anyways, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very pleased personally about this. So thank you. Well, good. Thank you. Um, the omega-3s can be taken with statins. Um, they are really great at helping lower triglycerides and then increase that good um, cholesterol, the HDL. But I think mm -hmm. I said, um, and I might have said statins, so if I did, I, I misspoke. But they should not be taken if someone is on a blood thinner. Okay. So that sounds the great. Warfarin and Eliquis and Pradaxa, stuff like that. I should try to avoid the omega 3. Wonderful. We'll go ahead and turn it over to Ms. Kevich. She's going to talk about uh, resources to help you improve the cholesterol levels of your patients in the home health setting. Also, talking about the CEs and how to obtain them. And then we'll come back to Chelsea for questions. So continue uh, putting your questions in the QA box. And Misty, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Chelsea, so far. I thought the questions were great. And I know I, I'm working on my cholesterol level, so I've learned a lot of information. And, um, and so has um, some of my colleagues, too. We've been back and forth. So thank you so much so far. Um, so we do have some resources for cholesterol management. Our cholesterol management and smoking cessation best practice intervention package, or as we call them, the BPIP, which is part two in our cardiovascular series. It includes all the current guidelines that were from the ATC and AHA. Lots of clinician and patient tools and resources are included there, and including um, a lot of the lifestyle modifications, including some DASH resources that she mentioned earlier about a really good teaching need for us for our patients. And I'm going to show you just quickly two nice patient tools, because with cholesterol management, sometimes in home health, we don't know what the cholesterol levels are unless we're drawing the lab work ourselves. And they're usually not ordered on a frequency that we might catch that um, blood work. So what we can do to help activate and engage the patient is to send them with this simple tool of questions they have for their doctor on their next visit. So it's asking the questions about when they sh when their blood work's due, what and we can fill, help them fill in what their blood pressure pills might be, but then asking what their cholesterol levels are. And then from a health literacy perspective, trying to use the green, yellow, and red so they have an understanding of where they are. And not just what a number is, but put the number, but also an idea of where they are in, um, in the range. And another really nice tool to use with our patients is an education sheet, taking control of your cholesterol. It's a two-page tool that goes over just some basic information about how to control your cholesterol. It is health literate, written at a fifth grade level, and there's a way for them to even track it on page on the back page um, so they'd be able to watch what their levels are to compare. Because I know if I don't have a copy of what my level is, I don't remember exactly what it was when I get my next level at the physician's office. We also, and I think because Chelsea also brought up about med adherence being a problem, and typically it's because of side effects they don't always tell us, but they may, they tend to tell us what that we think they want, they think we should hear. So we do have permission to use and then provide for you the Morosky Medication Adherence Scale, which we've had for the last couple of years that it's available. We have a tip sheet for it. Um, and it's just a simple way to have patients answer these, 
a couple questions to determine if there is potential adherence. Um, but the best piece of advice, you should assume that all patients are non-adherent until they prove otherwise and, and then really dive into what the underlying causes are because um, it's usually something that's very deeper and that the patient doesn't disclose. We also have our HHQI Medication Management Focus B-TIP, and in there, there is a really good tool on guiding your patients towards medication adherence, as well as some other really simple and good tools that you can use. So now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the continuing ed. Today, as Cindy said at the beginning, our session is worth 1.25 hours of CEs for nursing, um, that's credentialed through the ANCC. To get that, you need to log on to HHQI University. Now, make sure that it's not the HHQI general web page or where you go for your data reports or the BPIPs. It is the university. So if you stay, when you finish the course or the webinar today, if you're on live, you will be directed to it immediately. It'll only take you a couple minutes to finish out what you need to do, or you can do it later. You will receive an email with the link in it as well as well as it's linked within your slides. So you will go to the university and you will um, go ahead and sign in. If you've never been to the university to take one of the courses, then you will set up a, a registration. But if you've been here before but can't remember what your username is, like all of us, don't set up a, sec a second account because then you're gonna have your certificates split between two, two accounts, and it's easier to have everything in one. So we would rather you uh, email us at our mailbox that will be on the last slide, or hhqi at qualityinsights.org, um, and we will be happy to look you up to see if you're in there. And if you're having any password um, or it, your password issues, there is a, a button to click and they'll send you a a computerized generated key to go ahead and put in a new password. If you have any problems whatsoever, contact us through the mailbox and we'll be very happy to help you out. So once you get logged in, and honestly, that might be the hardest part of all of this, you need to go to, we have course catalogs. So go to the cardiovascular health. There are lots of topics that are there and lots of courses that you can take, but you will find the cardio, you will find the cholesterol, the good, the bad, and the ugly course. Go ahead and click on enroll, which is the little Apple icon. In, in your My Account tab, that course is going to be loaded for you, or at least showing you that you're registered. You, you just click on the My Account, and it's going to take you to where you will see the, the course, and you'll click on the green little book icon that's going to take you, start the course for you. Um, I will want, it'll get you to your first lesson, and there's only one lesson. It's simple once you open it. It's just a welcome, making sure your any colleagues that you work with, you can share the information. They can take it because the recorded webinar will be up later today or early tomorrow, and they can listen to the recorded webinar as well. And all you're going to do is you will click next when you hit that because you've already listened to the webinar, and you will do the evaluation and one simple reflection question, and that's it. And as soon as you uh, finish, you'll go to my account, and you will find your certificate on the left side of the slide, and you'll be able to print it or save it electronically. And really, that's as simple as it is, but we're always willing to help if you have any problems. And Cindy, I'm gonna send it back to you for any additional questions. Thank you, Misty. Chelsea, I think we're ready for rapid fire. Are you ready? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> we're going to get through as many questions as we can, but everyone, please continue sending in your questions. Any questions we don't get to, we'll find an alternate way to get your questions answered and posted on the website. So, Chelsea, the next question is, why avoid omega-3s with warfarin? Okay, so omega-3s. Um, they don't know exactly how it works, but the omega-3s also do something with inhibiting platelet aggregation. So mm -hmm. with warfarin, so the omega-3s itself could potentially increase your bleeding risk, but then when you add a blood thinner to it, it could also, also um, really increase the bleed risk. But this is typically rare, and everything I've read it said that this has rarely happened, but because it happened once, that has to be, at least once, that has to be a warning that that is on there. So if you do have a patient that is on both of these, make sure that they are getting their INR monitored 
and that you talk to them about um, signs of bleeding. So any weird bruising or bleeding um, from their gums or in their urine or stool, and if we're, if we're educating them about that, that can really help prevent any problems. And I think a lot of our patient and the patient population in the home health setting, many of them are on both medications, so that's really important to uh, yeah. take. So thank you. Uh, next Perfect. question, where can we find red yeast rice? Is it a grocery store oh. or a pharmacy item? <laughs> it is, it's a pharmacy item, and it is, it's in a capsule. So it's, we keep it with our vitamins, and I would say that's where most, most pharmacies would, would stock it. Next question, thank you for that. Next question is, I have a patient with high triglycerides and a low LDL. What is the best treatment? He is on extremely high statins. Okay, so he's on the statins already, which is first line. You could potentially add one of the fibric acid derivatives. So there's the phenofibrate or gemfibrazil, and those, those really help bring down triglycerides. And then um, you could also try the fish oil with that would be my recommendation. I just want to ask, and it's not anything on the polling question, but for the 50% of us, and I was one of them that does not have a community pharmacy, that pharmacist that we work with, are you starting to see the benefits? <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, I just, I'm thinking of all my patients that didn't have your knowledge and expertise guiding, and this is, this is great. Okay, next question. Can you explain more about how red wine helps increase your LDL and protect against plaque buildup? Yeah, so they, this is another one where they don't really understand the extent of how it works, but the ingredient that I talked about in red wine, which is resveratrol, is potentially an antioxidant, and so they think that the antioxidants help increase HDL, which helps get rid of the bad cholesterol um, and protect against the plaque buildup. Wonderful. Next one is, once a statin is started, when should we see their lipids decrease? Um, I typically tell people to check again around um, around three three months or so after they start a statin and see if that, that has helped. Okay. And at this time, the last one that we have is, can you explain again about the needing to administer statins in the evening? Yeah, so cholesterol is is made when you're, I'm trying to see how to phrase this right. It's made when your body is not taking in anything, it's, is when the majority of it's made. And so they, they say to administer statins when you're asleep because of obviously you're fasting while you're asleep and that's when the majority of cholesterol is, is produced. But there are a few statin medications that you don't have to worry about dosing at bedtime. But we typically just say, hey, you know, if they're okay with taking it at bedtime, go ahead and do it at bedtime just in case. But the statins that, that it doesn't matter when they're given were atorvastatin, which is Lipitor, and then Crestor, and, oh, I already forgot what the other one was. It's one of the ones that's not common. I think the... Lose a statin, but let me make sure. Well. Okay, yeah. Lipitor, Crestor, Crestor, and Patavastatin, which is the Lavalo, um, those can be given at any time during the day. Okay, that's great, and we have one more for clarification purposes, um, and I think that this is something we need to clarify. It says in the PowerPoint that the red wine may increase the LDL. Was that supposed to be HDL? No, I'm, I, and I may not have said this, but I, I have it written out on my notes, that that was a typo, and it, red wine can help decrease LDL by increasing HDL. So kind of a backwards thing there, but um, it can can increase HDL and decrease no, LDL. We 
<laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to talk over top of you there, but I, I want no, to thank Irene fine. for catching that and bringing it out yes, so that we can so clarify much. that. Uh, we yes. don't want any misconceptions, and that was a, a great catch. I apologize. I didn't catch it either, but that was um, wonderful. That's the, You guys in the cardio land world, we know we're all in this together, and that's just a yes. classic example. <laughs> So with this, we're at the top of the hour, so we're going to go ahead and say thank you to everybody for joining us. Mark your calendars. January 19th is the next up underserved population call, and I know that all of you are on here are cardiovascular oriented, but never forget your high-risk populations, and that's usually with your underserved population. Again, February 14th, for those of you, I understood that from some of your comments that I cut out, February 14th, 2017, Valentine's Day, Dr. Janet Wright. The Executive Officer of the Million Hearts Initiative is going to explain where Million Hearts 2.0 is going to go into the community, and that's where we all work. So I want to encourage you to set your calendars. We don't have the time secured yet. I'm sure it'll be in the afternoon, but once we have that, you'll be one of the first groups to know so that you can register. There will be limited space, as always, with all of our webinars, but just mark it. And our next Cardio Land will be on March 16th at 2 o'clock Eastern. I know that it's late in the call. You don't have to tell us now, but we'd like to hear from you what other topics you would like discussed during these Cardio Land events. Because of your feedback and requesting cholesterol information, we were able to discuss with Chelsea and have her present her expertise on here. So we want to encourage you, let us know what topics you're interested in, and we'll see what we can do. With that, we would like to say from all of us at HHQI and Quality Insights and Chelsea, we would like to say thank you for joining us this year. We want to wish you, your patients, your families, your friends, everyone, a very peaceful and safe holiday season. And with that, we'll say have a great day. Bye, everybody. Thank you.